Let's, let's look at it in verse number 13. And I'm just going to read that. And I'm going to pick up in 14 and I'm going to keep going. It says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, I want to begin teaching in verse number 15. So I'm going to read, and then I'm going to, I'm going to go in and try to give you what I feel the Holy Spirit has given us for this morning. It says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. We all know this scripture. We all know that in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart. Now, here we have the scripture that says, He that confesses, that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwelleth in him, and he in God. This, this tells me something here this morning. This has got to be more than just lip service. Because, you know, people can say all kinds of things. And there is, there is power in a proper confession, according to the Word of God. But it never overrides or nullifies or does away with the belief that's in one's heart. So remember that. So we have to be sure that what we are speaking lines up with how we're walking. Because then we begin to realize what it really means to, under, to have a proper confession. So the confession principle is based on not just speaking, but it's on believing. Because what we find ourselves doing is really what we believe. Now think about that just for a minute. Think about that in comparison to your own spiritual life, your own walk, your consecration before the Lord, because that's what I had to do and have been doing for some time. And the Lord has been really making that more real to me, that what we believe is what we find ourselves doing. Really, and I, now I understand, now, that I understand that we as, as Christians, human beings, flawed vessels that God is still perfecting, still molding, still making, that sometimes we fail. We do things that are incorrect. We do things that don't line up with God's word because of our frailty, of, of who we are in the flesh, our, our, the frailness of our flesh, the, the weakness of our flesh. It's, but it's never... It's never to control or dictate the, the system that we find ourselves working in. And I'm, because I, what I'm saying is, we can't take that approach to say, oh, I'm weak, and I'm weak, I'm frail, I'm this, and I'm going to sin, and God understands. That's not the correct approach. And I, and I pray this morning as we go on into our study that we'll see scripturally what I'm trying to say. But I, I, I had to bring it a, across this way. Because every person, every, let me just narrow it down this morning because I'm speaking to the church. Every child of God has a destination. G give me just a minute. We have a destination. Okay? And, and to get to our destination, it involves us being in the will of God. That, that we have to keep that that focus. Then we have a dependency. 
there is a dependency for the child of God. And that is his, the, the very presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer. We have to depend upon the Holy Spirit for everything. Because he is, he is the one who comes in and empowers us as we keep our faith correct. He is the one that comes in and, and changes us from the inside out and brings about God's purpose in our life. And thirdly, we have to have a dedication. So we have a destination, a dependency, and a dedication. We have to be dedicated. And the one thing that we can never stray from is in our dedication is to go by the way of the cross. That is the only chance for the believer to ever succeed and do anything on this earth for the kingdom of God. We must be dedicated to the way of the cross. And I hope that every time that I get an opportunity to stand before a group of people, that I can somehow, some way, bring this point into consideration that there's no other way. There's no other way we can successfully and do and complete the will of God in our life to reach our destination, to really truly depend on God every day in our life unless we have that dedication of being ever faithful to that old rugged cross, the way that has been provided for all of mankind. Don't you Ain't thank God for revelation? Just how the Spirit of God works and, and, and just works with us on an individual basis. Because he's just good about that. He's good about being good and, and taking care of his children. No, I mean, I, I love, I love to, to say that. Now, and we have known, I'm going to read verse 16. He says, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So here we now, we have been speaking and teaching for some time now on the love of God. And this is, this is powerful once we, once we can get the insight of what the love of God wants to do for us and has done already for us but wants to do in us. Because I'm going to make a statement that a lot of people haven't looked at it this way, but I really believe that the Lord has given me a little bit of a revelation, beginning to give me a little bit of a revelation on understanding more of his love in our life. Love is the greatest. Okay? It is, it is, it's, it says there abides three, faith, hope, and love. And of the greatest of these, this is in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these is love. The old King James says charity, but he's speaking of love. The greatest of these is love. So love is the greatest. And love, the love of God, is the source, if you will, of every, every, everything we need to empower us to be a child of God, to be a, a believer, to walk in victory. When people start, when we start to focus on the power of God at work in our life, it all goes back and points to his love. And where was his love displayed? On an old rugged cross. On a hill far away. That's where it stood. And that's where God displayed his love for lost and fallen humanity. And that the more that we can allow that principle to work in our life, the more that can change us as an individual, and it, then it begins to change us as a home, 
Then it begins to change us as a community. It begins to change us as a church. It begins to change us as a city. And it keeps growing and it keeps changing and it keeps spreading. But it's about letting the love of God have his way in our life. I, I really believe that I'm that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close to telling you the truth this morning. That's, I mean, I, I'm, I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't believe it. That's what I believe. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close on this, so please, I'm, we've all got Bibles, and we've all got the Word of God before us, and we've got time to look at it and study it, but it is in His love that we are to function, that we are to grow, that we are to move forward. It's all about how much God has loved us. You know, his love is so, and I don't, when I emphasize this, I'm not trying to minimize it, but I'm trying to magnify it. Because much of the church today looks at God's love in a minimizing way, because it allows them, they believe, to not please God. Well, God loves me anyway. See, they don't understand the principle of operating in the love of God. And I'm not trying to look like somebody that understands it all because I don't. But I'm beginning to understand this. I'm beginning to get a revelation by the Holy Spirit in this as I continue to seek Him, as I continue to look into His face. I want to understand it. I want to be able to tell others about it. I want to be able to show others about how God wants to change us through the power of his love. Now, let's read on. Verse number 17. Herein, he says, is our love made perfect. Do you see that written down right there? It says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There's a lot being said right here in this verse of scripture. And I'm going to try to do it just a little bit of justice this morning. To say this. First of all, this is, an, this is something that God intends for every child of God. Not just one in ten. Not just one every once in a while. But to be made perfect in the love of God. Now, please understand, this is all a work of grace. This is not about us and our self-efforts. It's not in us laboring to the point of making ourselves do this, making ourselves do that, but it's about letting the grace of God work in us to understand the true transforming power that only comes when we put our faith exclusively in the finished work of Christ. It's the grace of God, that, the Spirit of God that's within us, and then He can't work. He can work. If, if we don't stay there, if we don't keep our faith there, He can't work. Doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not there, but He can't do what He wants to do. We begin to grieve the Spirit of God when we don't let Him work. And it affects us in a negative way. But we have to, to let him work. And the only way he can work is we have to cooperate with him. We have to want it. We have to desire to grow in, in this love, to be perfected in the love of God. We have to want this. And see, we don't even have, we don't have the power we think we do, even to make ourselves want it. We can't even make ourselves want it. All we can do is just present ourselves to Him. And then He begins to give us the desires of our heart. You see? See, I, I like to preach that scripture in a way that, that's going to bring glory to Him and everything. Because so much junk in my heart, it ain't of God. I'm talking about desires. 
okay? But when, it, when God begins to give us the desires of our heart, it brings glory unto him. Because then, you see, it's, it ain't about us. It ain't about what I've done. It ain't about my, uh, my hard work and my labors and the things that, that I've involved myself in. No, I'm, I just want to give it back to him. And he begins to then give us desires. And our, yes, I, and I don't want to waste my time on this, but God wants us to be blessed. I, I believe that 100%. And, and we were talking yesterday about how that, you know, sometimes, you, you know, when, when somebody wants to give you something, okay, they, they just want to give you something. Or are you expecting to pay somebody for something that's not, I just want to give this to you. It, you know how it kind of makes you feel, don't it? We, we kind of got that pride thing, kind of, kind of gets in the way. I said, no, I, I want to pay you for this. But you know, learning how to give, let me say, I'm going to say this right. When we properly learn how to give, we need to properly learn how to receive. The Word of God says, when we do what we're supposed to do, when we seek first the kingdom of God, then he says all these things will be added unto us. Another, th another time he says, he says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. So God uses mankind to give things to his children. You believe that? Now, you know, God, we can never outgive God, of course, but we, but we need to, have to learn how to receive and not, you know, and I'm learning. It, it, it's, it's a process. It's, it's something we have to learn. It's just something that has to be completely washed out of us. But I'm learning. But to, how, to over, how to excel in receiving is to be a giver. When we, when, we, when we want to receive more, we learn how important it is to give more. Y'all agree with that? Because we can't just sit back and, and do all the taking. We're to be that conduit of flow, that, that just a continual flow in the kingdom of God. And that's, that's how I really believe God wants us to function. Now, we looked at the confession principle now we're looking in, and, and we're seeing how that confession is not just lip service. It's not just me standing before you and confessing something that I've rehearsed or something that I have written down or something that I have memorized. No. Confession is a way of life. It's a habit. It's, 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 a, it's a new way of living. Now here he says in verse 17, when love is being perfected, because that is a process within every one of us, it brings boldness, okay? Now, the scripture says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That does not mean that we will not have boldness before then. But it is simply saying that we are now living a life of having that boldness and, and where that word can be better understand by having the confidence that we need today. It ain't until we get before the judgment seat of Christ, because that's, that's what he's speaking about. Did you know, and I'm just reminding you, and I know all y'all do, that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every believer. And we have been having some fantastic, awesome, amazing teachings about the end times on Wednesday nights. I think all y'all will concur and agree on that. Now, you know, I want to make a statement. We in here today are all created beings, aren't we? But do you ever stop and think for a moment that I, as a created being, will stand before the Creator? I, I, want, I want you to stop and think of how, what a humbling thought that is. That, that I personally will stand before the Creator. Okay? Now, that's, 
Now, the church is not going to stand before the Creator in aspects of whether they're saved or not. They're going, that's, a, that's a complete different judgment, as, as is referred to in the Scripture as the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will answer for things done in this body while we're here on this earth for his glory. Whether it's for us or whether it's for him. And we'll be rewarded accordingly. But nevertheless, we will still stand, the creation will stand before the creator. And we will be more aware then than we are right now. You won't be in like some kind of slumber and sleep and be like having a dream. No, it will be more real than me standing before you right here today. Because, you know, there may be things in your body right now that is, is, is numbing you just a little bit. Now, please, I know most of us probably drink coffee in the mornings. It helps stimulate us a little bit. It kind of loosens us up a little bit. Some of us might have had to take a, a pain pill this morning to help with some pain we've been dealing with. There won't be none of that. We're going to be completely open and exposed to the Creator. But here the Scripture is telling us that if we are allowing the love of God to be perfected in our life, that today we can have confidence, we can have boldness, and it will be the same boldness as when we stand before our Creator. It is going to be the same. He wants, us for, he wants it for us right now. But it only comes one way. To be perfected, to be made perfect in his love. To, to let, it, let that love be perfected in our hearts. And that only comes one way. We've got to look to where the love was presented. We've got to live in that. We've got to always have that first and foremost in our life to know that it was because Jesus was sent to this world that he loved us first. Ain't that good? Oh, how God so loved the world that he gave. And we were terribly rotten, putrid in his sight. But he gave us, he, he gave the best that he had for us. And don't that just want to make you love him more? When we, when we begin to, to, to just get that in the inside of us and let it just begin to, to just work on us and gnaw on us and, and, and change on us and, and just affect us and, and make us say, hey, you know, I've got something I've got to live up to here. I've got something God's expecting from me. I, I, you know, he wants us to be thankful, of course, but not just in, in, like I say, this gets back just to lip service, not just in saying something, but to live it, to walk in it. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. Colossians 2 and 6. We've got to... As we receive him, we walk in him the same way, and that's by our faith being in this sacrifice. That's how he enables us to walk in him. It, it ain't in our own self-efforts, but it's in him working through us and changing us and, and giving us the confidence that we need, giving us the boldness that, that even where we will have when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We can have it today. Because now he says... The last part of verse 17, he says, because as he is, talking about Jesus, as Jesus is, our Savior, our Lord, our Shepherd, whatever we need him for, he's that. As he is, so are we in this world. Now, there's all kind of things we can apply this to in life. But I believe we can just begin by saying that this is speaking of having victory. Because I know that for a fact, when Jesus gave his life on that cross 
and all the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that he took them and he folded them over and he nailed them to his cross and said, this is paid for in full. So in doing that, the Bible tells us how that in, when he gave his life on the cross, he didn't do it that it was a defeat. It was a victory. It was the greatest victory ever known in the, in, in the world or will ever been when the Son of God made, gave his life as a perfect sacrifice on the cross. Triumphing over all the spiritual wickedness, all the, 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 the enemy's works and everything that he had, all the plans of the enemy. Jesus triumphed over that. His blood satisfied the demands of God the Father. Paid the price for the lost humanity. For all who would come, all who would believe, all who would enter in unto him and dwell in him. He says that God may dwell in him and, he, and, 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 and us in God. That's what we just read a while ago. It's about the dwelling. It's about the communion. It's about us being one with him. We, we have to commune with God. The creation before the creator. He made the way, church. I mean, look at us. Just, just look at us for a minute. <laughs> and people look to other people for their answers. <laughs> Woo, help us Lord help us we need to look to him first and we can and our life will, will prove it'll show that hey that that woman's trusting in God that man's trusting in God they're putting God first and I know we, we've got sometimes we got hang up sometimes we still want to Go to our, well, they call them BFFs now. <laughs> our besties or whatever. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Let me say how I'm getting this. This is really good. Thank God. When, when, when we have boldness, we have no crumbs about going to someone. And the boldness here he's talking about is the love of God. If we really get the revelation of how much God loves us. We won't have a problem going to Him with yes. anything. Yes, yes. I anything. And not knowing anything, but going to Him for everything. You know, this is why I was listening to a song and said, I surrender. I said, God, I don't know how to surrender. You know, I uh, think I do. Right. But I <laughs> truly don't. And so I have to look back to the work that He did for me on the cross. To show me how to do that. And, and when I was thinking of that, I wasn't even talking about surrendering to salvation. You know, I'm pretty selfish. We but all I are. I surrender. And so I look to him because he loves me. I can go totally and be honest with him. With somebody who really loves you, and you know it, you have no trouble going to them being who you truly are. You know, I, when I had COVID, the other week, I called a friend of mine because I was out of meds. My kid was out of town. Couldn't get my brothers. And when I knew, I told Courtney later, I said, you know, Kevin really likes me. She went, in the weather, raining, cold, to get what I needed. Amen. And I didn't know you were sick, <laughs> but she didn't tell me that. But... But when somebody really love you, they're going to be there for you no matter what. Amen. And our part is being bold enough to ask for help. Amen. Being bold enough to ask and receive help. And that's the cross. Praise God. <clears throat> Thank you for that. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Verse number 18 says, well, that, 
went off. It got quiet in here, didn't it? When that unit went off, whatever that was. It says, there is no fear in love. How many times have we quoted this scripture? When, when we would be dealing with some type of fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. I want to stop right there just for a minute. This is still talking about the boldness that we are to operate in, the confidence that we're to operate in, even on into the day of judgment. When I asked that question a while ago, nobody knows this but our own selves. Whether that struck a little bit of fear in us or whether we're okay with knowing one day I'm going to stand before my Creator. Now, we, now, now please understand. When, we're, when we haven't matured in the love of God, we still got a little fear there. Of things may not be just like the way they ought to be. But as we are perfected, as we are matured in the love of God, we know, we know that today... That he says, as he is, so are we in this world. We know that today we can have that same confidence, that same boldness, no matter, as Sister Rose brought out to us, no matter what the, the need is, that we can have that today. And that's the same that we are to have as we go and stand before him one day, because we know that today, that this could be the day we go home to meet him, because we don't know what a day may bring forth. We just don't know. But we can have that at whatever level we're at today. The good news is he wants us to grow in it. He wants to, that it be perfected in us, that it keeps growing. That, now, please understand, that does not nullify or, or, or make you less saved. If you haven't, if you're not operating in the, in the, perfect, the, the love of God perfectly, that's what I'm trying to say. That doesn't make you more saved or less saved. That doesn't have anything to do with your justification. I mean, you can be a child of God. I mean, hey, that's, that's, that's the good news. But also, as you're here today, and I, I'm presenting this to you, and it seems like all of you are pretty well paying attention, that now we've got a responsibility that I, I need to be getting this on track. If there's anything in my life I've been just kind of letting kind of skate by, that he's been, especially he's been dealing with me, and I just kind of been putting him off like we do sometimes. <laughs> but then we get, we get responsible then. We get, you know, we, we, could get to, we could get a switching. Now, this, I, I want to say something about that real quick. Chastisement. And, and okay, let's see where where was that out? Um, torment is really punishment, okay? But but chastisement and punishment's not the same meaning. It doesn't carry the same meaning, okay? Punishment comes from just and I, I'm I, let me let me just stop right there just a minute. I don't want to say something that's wrong. Let me just focus on chastisement for a minute. God, those that God loves, he chastises, okay? Because he loves us. That's, that's one of the, the earmarks. That's one of the proofs that we're his child, is that we're chastised when we need it. But it's through his love for us. If, if we find ourselves needing a little chastisement, it's because he loves us and, he, and he'll administer it the way that he knows is best. We don't, even have to, we don't even have to worry about that because we're in him. We're in his hands. We're in his care. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So if we continue down that road of operating out of fear, we cannot then operate in the love of God because those two are incompatible one with the other. So I want to enforce that point this morning. Let the love of God work in us to, to make in us what he wants and desires for our life. 
John 8, 32 tells us that you shall know the truth, and it's the truth, truth that will make you free. And all that I'm, all that I'm speaking of here this morning, there's one word that comes to me through this, is to understand what it means to be delivered. When we're talking about fear and, and, and lack of confidence, lack of boldness. You see, deliverance is part of salvation. Sal- salvation covers so broad of an area in our life. True deliverance only comes as one looks to the cross. For every part and parcel of our life, for everything, every problem we would ever face, to experience what true deliverance is all about. Then the love of God begins to work in us and change us and, and, and bring about the, the desire for, that God has for all of us in our lives. In 1 John 2, 5 and 6, I'm not going to go there for time's sake, but you can write that down. But it tells us that the love of God to be perfected in our life. We, we covered that a few weeks back. I'm just kind of giving you a reference back to it. 1 John 2, 5 and 6. Look in, um, I'm going to finish this up now because I'm just about out of time. Verse number 19. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God. And Brother Adam referred to this last Sunday morning during his his message. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment, have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. You know, all this, all that we said here this morning, all that I tried to bring out and everyone that else that participated, <clears throat> we're all on the same track. We're all looking to the same destination that we talked about earlier. And to know that in this verse of Scripture, that's, that's not a, none of the Word of God is really a pick and choose. I won't, I won't pick and believe this part and not so much that part. I'm not going to fool with that, you know. This is as real as any of it. Because God so loved the world. And If a man say that I love God yet hates his brother and he says he is a liar, he is also deceived because he has believed that he's serving a God that's going to save him, that's saying it's okay for him to stay that way. That it's it's okay for you to operate in hate. It's okay. But, they, but they're believing in this God that's going to save them. That's not true. It's not true. It's, that's deception. If there's a, it's not even deception at its finest, maybe, is to believe that you're saved, but you're not. That you're, that you're serving a God that has, gone, that has saved you, but he hasn't. The scripture says he is a liar. The man that has said, I love God. I'm talking about the God, the capital G God, and hates hates his brother. Jesus said it, and I I want to read this. Um, I had some other things to look at this morning, but I'm not going to be able to uh, share them with you this morning because I'm I'm out of time. But I I, I want to to end with what the Lord gave us in, um, I think, let me see if I wrote it down. If not, we may just have to stop because I don't remember the, Verse exactly. Let's see. Anyway, I, I'm not going to read it because I didn't write it down. But um, <clears throat> whenever they came, I believe it's in the book of Mark. I'm just going to paraphrase some of this to give you something good to go study and look up. 
Jesus said, you know, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And then he said, and the second one is like unto it, is that you love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe that came to him and asked him that question said, Master, you've answered right. And then John, he, he gave, he said, he says, I give you this new commandment that you love, love, love one another as I have loved you. So, yeah, I, I didn't write them down to give you verbatim exactly the scripture, but I'm, I'm, it's in there. So, I, I'm just, I want to leave you with that this morning, that his love, where would we be without his love? It wouldn't be good, would it? Thank you all for your attention this morning and participation. God bless you.